This bike rolled off the assembly line in May of 1994. I was nine years old at the time, and although I don't remember the Cannondale F500 specifically, I do remember walking into a bike shop and seeing this, the head shock. This head shock was a proprietary suspension platform released by Cannondale in 1992. And as you can see, there's a rubber boot above the fork and below the head tube. This was not just an experimental product available for a few years. This was a mainstay on Cannondale mountain bikes for about a decade, and then on hybrid and commuter bikes for another two decades. As many of you know, this is not the only weird suspension fork made by Cannondale. There's also the Lefty, and we can actually trace the Lefty's roots back to the head shock. But mountain biking did outgrow the head shock for reasons that will become clear in this video. And that's a shame because it was and still is really good in certain ways. And today I'm gonna tell you all about it. Go ahead and try a 90s suspension fork. You'll notice that it's kind of sloppy, the small bump sensitivity is not that great, and the steering precision is abominable. The head shock was Cannondale's answer to all of these issues. And it more or less addressed all of those concerns. Even by today's standards, a well-maintained head shock is really, really smooth and has really, really good small bump sensitivity. When you sideload a traditional suspension fork from the 90s, You'll notice it kind of binds up and judders a little bit. It doesn't really perform that well under those conditions. The head shock was more or less unaffected by this. Ride the head shock on a gravel road or some single track with lots of tiny bumps. It is buttery smooth. It is truly remarkable. And we have its unique design to thank for that. Up on the top of the stem where the cap normally would be is this knob. That's a lockout that's really easy to access. Why you would need to lock out a 50 millimeter suspension fork? Well, your guess is as good as mine, but it works really well. And yes, you heard right, 50 millimeters of suspension travel. These head shocks eventually went up to 80 millimeters. If you're not a mountain biker, I'm talking about how much the suspension moves, how much travel it has. As a point of comparison, an average trail bike today would have 150 millimeters of suspension travel. So here are some of the reasons why the head shock is weird. First of all, just look at it. You don't see many suspension forks that look like that. These only fit on Cannondale bikes, and so it was somewhat limited, but that wasn't the only limitation. As you can see, this stem is slammed against the head tube. You couldn't put stack spacers underneath the stem of a head shock. If you wanted to adjust your stack, you had to buy an entirely different stem, and you couldn't just use any old stem because the thing had a 1.56 inch steer tube. Of course it did. So yeah, there are threadless stems that fit the head shock, and then there are threadless stems that fit everything else. But it is funny that as a consequence of the head shock's internals, they had to put this big fat head tube on the bike, and eventually the entire industry would go to head tubes of about this diameter. Also weird, this sticker of this photoshopped guy with a big old head, this isn't something that the previous owner put on the fork, it came with it, this is Brad. If you were a kid in the 90s, you know that this looks like something you would see on a pog. And actually, this comes from the movie Pulp Fiction. There's a line, look at the big brain on Brett. And somebody at Cannondale misheard it as Brad. And so this is Brad. I don't really get it. I mean, he's got a big head and this is the head shock, but I don't know, it was the 90s. And so, where did I get this Cannondale F500? Well, Facebook Marketplace, of course, it only cost me $100. Yes, somewhere along the line, it was converted to single speed. Maybe someday I'll put some period correct parts on it and restore it. Modifications aside, the previous owner of this head shock took really good care of it. It seems like it might have even been recently serviced. It works really smoothly and it was a great example for this video. And so I'm gonna jump on this bike and go for a little ride and give you some off the cuff thoughts on this head shock. All right, let's start with this locked so I can get a feel for this 90s F500 with no suspension. This is not a very rough trail, but oof, full rigid, you can definitely feel it. And it's always remarkable how bad the geometry was on just early 90s bikes. You can use a Walmart bike today with 29 inch wheels and just blow one of these out of the water. 
but it was still a very well built bike. I'm gonna unlock the head shock here, get up a little more speed. Oh, immediately it feels way more plush. And a trail like this is really appropriate at the end of the day for 50 millimeters of suspension. Here we got some little roots here. It really feels good. The shock feels mostly linear and that it sort of moves the same all the way through its travel. And then it ramps up kind of quick at the end, which is nice because it doesn't bottom out as bad as you might expect it to. Yeah, it's really remarkable. Even the damper isn't that bad. All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah, probably gonna skip this on this. So I made an attempt at drawing what the head shock's shaft looks like. It's basically a cylinder with four flat sections cut into it. Now those flat surfaces are there for two reasons. One, it keeps it from rotating, which is important because you're steering with this thing, but also it's a surface that needle bearings roll on. So instead of having two stanchions plunging into wiper seals and bushings, this is basically rolling up and down. It's said to be frictionless. That's a little bit misleading, but I think you get the picture. You can see there's a lot of friction there. Let's pretend this is not a stanchion, but rather a needle bearing. And this is the shaft of the head shock. It's basically going like this. There is almost no resistance at all, and there's really nothing you have to do to get it started. It just starts moving, and that's the way the head shock feels when you step on the bike. It just immediately is really plush and sensitive. And so when you're going over really small bumps, a normal shock, especially from the 90s, had to overcome this stiction before it got moving, whereas the head shock was just kind of rolling along these bearings. And so especially at the time, it was the smoothest thing out there. Suspension forks from the 90s all had these rubber boots on them, but when you pull back one on a traditional suspension fork, you're just exposing the stanchion to some dirt. On a head shock, if you pull this boot back, it's like pulling back Terminator's skin. All the internals are just exposed, and so it was really, really important to keep this in good working order and keep it secured well. These zip ties were actually from the factory, and if you serviced it and had to move the boot around, you would then put another zip tie on it to make sure that no dirt would get inside. Back then, if you were lax on maintenance, you would quickly find that your bearings and races would start corroding and your damper would get all gummed up in pretty short order. Now, another common issue was bearing migration. So we take my little example here with the pipe and the piece of wood. You can see here that on each revolution, this pipe just kind of ends up in the same spot. But if we do this, thousands and thousands and thousands of times, eventually it migrates and somewhere along the middle of its travel, the bearing is in the wrong spot. And so you would have to reset it. And that would involve taking this entire fork off the bike, disassembling it, pulling out the damper, and then topping out the fork and pushing the bearing back into the right place so that it would sink back up. And if you rode your bike really hard, this would have to be done fairly often. Most people back in the 90s would have taken their head shock to a Cannondale service center to have it worked on. I bought this head shock on eBay so I could attempt to take it apart. It's missing some parts here, but you can see this castle tool is one that you would have had to buy, but it was able to come apart with very little resistance. It doesn't like that. But now that I have all the parts out on the table, I could see that if you knew what you're doing, it wasn't that big of a deal, but it looks really, really intimidating. You can see here, we have this round shaft with these flat spots cut into it, and these flat pieces of metal were the bearing races. Each set of these needle bearings is kind of a cartridge. It's just a sheet with these rollers on them, and that's what held all the needle bearings in place. Again, when these would migrate, you'd have to kind of hold them in place and top out the fork to reset their position. Now, as the travel went from 50 to 60 to 80 millimeters, Cannondale started to run out of space inside the head tube. What's more, all of these fit inside the same size head tube, and so whether the bike was a small, medium, or large, 
this was the same. And throughout the 90s, people started to get more serious about mountain biking and they got pickier about bike geometry. Downhill was becoming a thing and the head shock was really starting to limit Cannondale. Yet, they still had basically the smoothest suspension out there. And so around 1997, Cannondale's race team started experimenting with a prototype two-legged fork made out of two 150 millimeter head shocks. Again, this was all prototype only on their race team. Now, this thing was so overbuilt that one of the race mechanics removed a leg from it and started riding it around the pit with just one leg. And everybody kind of stared at it and thought, hmm. The thing was pretty close as is to being stiff enough to be used with one leg. And so Cannondale thought, this might be the solution to our travel problem. We can use this same technology we already had, make a one-legged fork, and give it as much travel as we want. And thus, the lefty was born. And as you saw in my other video, the lefty still exists today. And even today, it's using much of the same technology as the head shock. So with this replacement technology, Cannondale no longer needed the head shock for their mountain bikes, but they still used it on their commuter bikes. In fact, on Cannondale's website right now, there's a picture of a bike with a head shock. But now that we have the full story, it gives me a newfound respect for those engineers and what they did. This is some really outside of the box thinking here. It's easy to just write both of these products off as Cannondale being stubbornly different for its own sake. And even if there is a little grain of truth to that, at the time, suspension forks were kind of juddery and sloppy and the head shock did solve those issues. And in the case of the lefty, they did solve the travel problem while also leveraging technology they had already invested heavily in. And yes, there are many reasons, as we discussed, that your bike probably does not have a head shock or a lefty on it, but that's why out-of-the-box thinking is so admirable. And in the case of the head shock and the lefty, it was part of an evolution of products at Cannondale. If you liked this video, you could have seen it two weeks ago on Substack. We post all videos from Burn Peak and Burn Peak Express two weeks early, and we post articles written by some of the most interesting voices in mountain biking. Even if you sign up on our free tier, we do post freebies here and there. On Substack, you're helping me and possibly yourself break free from the algorithm. You're in control of the content you see. If you want to check it out, follow the link below. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive and historical overview of the head shock. I hope you learned something, and if you didn't, I hope you at least found this entertaining. Thanks for riding with me today. I'll see you next time.